Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, video lecture on Jonathan Edwards and Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Jonathan Edwards lived from 1703 to 1758 and he lived during the, 18, the 18th century which as we've talked about before is the time of enlightenment and that's an important thing to remember as we get into looking at Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He was a, a theologian and preacher uh, throughout the New England area, though mainly focused in uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut. He is really under, understood as, as an icon of the Great Awakening, and the Great Awakening is this religious movement that in part is a response to the uh, to the Enlightenment. Uh, it, it's a movement within American history and, and really worldwide, or, or at least within the Western world, of trying to revive investment, belief, and spiritual connectedness to Christianity. Uh, and Edwards is one of the the Edwards is one of the main people who are trying to do this, largely through the spoken word and going from churches to you know from church to church and uh, this is part of that old this is part of a, a tradition of church revivals that you see even up through the modern day with people like Billy Graham and a lot of what Edwards does is trying to balance man's inherent sin uh, with God with, with the fact that you cannot know God, or, or what he believes to be God, uh, in the ways in which people think they can. And, you know, he's using the Bible and he's using, you know, a, a lot of different theology to make this argument. Uh, but he's doing it in a new way, I would say. And this is kind of what makes Edwards m interesting, intriguing, compelling, is that he's trying to apply the rational logic of the Enlightenment. Uh, you'll see in his in his writing, you know, he does this very systematic and, and clear direct approach and levels logic um, in ways to complete or to make his arguments succinct. And at, at the core of his belief, and this is true within much of Christianity throughout much of time, is that salvation is genuinely threatened. That is, salvation, you know, we all assume, hey, I do good deeds, I should be fine. But Edwards, in his understanding of the Bible, is, is to believe that it's genuinely threatened. It is not just, well, you did some good deeds, so you are okay. But that we exist merely because God allows us to, and that were were he not to, we would be stricken immediately. So, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, it was a sermon that he gave in 1741, and he had repeated it several times throughout. And the, it, it's most famous because there's a certain amount of what they call fire and brimstone uh, uh, preaching that goes on here, and this idea of th almost threatening, threatening the people with that idea of eternal damnation to get them to pay attention. So it originally was presented in Northampton, Massachusetts, and it really is, you know, an attempt to get people reinvested in Christianity. So as I like to say, you know, it's kind of a, uh, it, it's, it reminds me of Monster, uh, Monsters, Inc. And the idea of we scare because we care. So he starts off this, the sermon with a reference to Deuteronomy 32:35, their foot shall slide in due time. And this is what he uses for the basis of his entire presentation in this idea that it's the foot will slide in due time, that very, very, it, it was only a matter of time before you slip into temptation, before you slip into or slip away from salvation. And so he lays out, you know, this argument, you know, one, that they were always exposed to destruction, right? That we are always exposed to damnation. It implies that they were always exposed to sudden, unexpected destruction, right? That slide, there's no definitive moment of the slide. It just unexpectedly slips, right? So at any moment, we could end up destroying ourselves. Another thing implied is that they are liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the hand of another. Right? So Edwards is saying this can happen of your own accord unexpectedly and it will happen. That the reason why they are not fallen already and do not fall is 
only that God's appointed time has not come. So he's saying it is only God's grace that keeps you from falling into that pit. That you are poised over for destruction. You, you are just hanging right over for destruction at any moment. But it is God that keeps that from happening. There is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Men's hands can't be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. There is no fortress that is any defense from the power of God. And so here, you know, he's saying, you, it does, when God desires to do something, strength has no bearing. Strength is, human strength is nothing in comparison to God's strength. There are in, in the souls of wicked men those hellish principles reigning that would presently kindle and flame out into hellfire if it were not for God's restraints. So here again, Edwards is saying, these, the, the, the evils the hellish principles of evil men exist only because God restrains himself from extinguishing them, from casting those people into hell. God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural man out of hell one moment. God certainly has made no promises either to eternal life or of any deliverance or, or pers uh, preservation from eternal death, but what are contained in the covenant of grace, the promises that are given in Christ, in whom all the promises are yea and amen. So again, he's saying, without following the absolute covenants of grace and those promises to Christ that are found in the Bible, there is no obligation. There is no promises. There is no, op there is no reason for God to save you. And I'm saying you, and I'm not referring to you, the reader, but this is Edwards as he talks to his crowd to get them to understand that there is nothing holding them from potential destruction except God's grace. This that you have heard is the case of every one of you that are, are out of, of Christ. That world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone, is an eternal, is, is an extended, uh, extended abroad under you. There is the dreadful pit of the glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide, gaping mouth open, and you have nothing to stand upon, nor anything to hold of. There is nothing between you and hell but the air. Tis only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. So this, this is, you know, one of the most powerful that you could imagine Edwards building up to this particular passage and really milking it with, you know, a, a very strong reverberance, a, a, you know, just getting hold of the people to understand where or how vulnerable they are, right? They are sinners in the hands of an angry God. And if they do not act rightly, they will find themselves in this in this uh, dreadful pit of glowing frame, flames. Were it not that so is the sovereign pleasure of God, the earth would not bear you one moment, for you are a burden to it. The creature groans with you. The creation groans with you. The creature is made subject to the bondage of your corruption. Not willingly. The sun don't willingly shine upon you to give you light to serve sin and Satan. The earth don't willingly yield her increase to satisfy your lust, nor is it willingly a stage for your wickedness to be acted upon. The air don't willingly serve you for breath to maintain the flame of life in, in your vitals while you spend your life, the flame of life in your vitals while you spend the life, spend your life in the service of God's enemies. So all of this is, you know, again, he's building, he, he's trying to convince that without that righteous path, path, and even with that righteous path, there's no guarantee unless you are adhering to God's will. God's creatures uh, are good and were made for men to serve God w with and don't willingly subserve to any other purpose and groan when they are 
abused to purposes so directly contrary to their nature and end, and the world would spew you out were it not for the sovereign hand of him who hath subjected it in hope. There are the black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your head, full of dreadful storm and big with thunder, and were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you. So you can imagine sitting in a church, in a, in a lecture hall, listening to Edwards build up this and try to convince people the need to give themselves over to Christianity in full, not just half-assing it, not just, you know, doing a little bit, but actually fully embracing and doing, um, you know, following the belief to its fullest. O oh, sinner, consider the dreadful, f the fearful danger you are in. Tis a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of fire, of, full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God, whose wrath is provoked and increased as much against you as many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender th th thread with the flames of the divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder and you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself nothing to keep off the flames of wrath nothing of your own nothing that you ever have done nothing that you can do to induce god to spare you one moment so again you can imagine after you know throughout this entire speech, this entire sermon, just wave upon wave and point upon point of how tenuous your grip on the world is, particularly or even more so when you are not when you have not found and sought salvation through Christianity. Alright, so hopefully that gives you a flavor of what to look for when you step into Edward's work and to better appreciate the ways in which he's trying to make this argument and, as I said, scare because he cares. Um, really take a look and see what else is going on in that, in that sermon because there is a whole lot. Alright, thank you for listening. See you in the next lecture.